Hi everyone, this is part two of this little series uh, on abstract algebra and groups. Um, in this part, I'm going to prove four uh, basic properties of groups that, um, that follow directly from, uh, from the axioms of a group. Uh, and this is also a good video because if you're not familiar with it, it demonstrates how to prove things using abstract algebra. So without further ado, here is part two. Okay, so I want to show you that the stuff that I'm showing you isn't, it's not directly important for the group law, but this is the stuff that I think is the basics, the very basics of groups in abstract algebra, and it'll certainly come up again. Um, and what we're gonna get to in a minute is specifically important for uh, the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Um, so, okay, next I want to show you um, just a couple of the uh, a couple of the properties that are that immediately spring up from what what we've said so far. Um, so we just say uh, theorem. Um, the identity. of a group is unique. The proof is very easy. Um, assume that there's two of them. Assume that we're, uh, so assume there are two. E1 and E2. All we have to do to prove that this has to be unique is use the identity uh, property on them. So we know that if E1, by definition, we're saying that, um, that E1 is an identity, right? That means that E1 times E2 equals E2, right? Because this is, this is the identity. The identity times anything is itself. So we know that this equals E2. We also know that E2 is an identity. The identity times anything is itself, so that means that this equals E1. Well, then that means that E1 equals E2. So that means that this, that, that indeed it's unique. We can't have more than one identity in a group, okay? That's one. The next, important uh, uh, important property of groups is that uh, each element has a unique inverse. So these two things are, are very important because they really limit the structure of, of the groups, as we'll see in a minute. So to prove this, so what we're saying is that not only is the um, identity unique, but each element has a unique inverse. There's only one element in the group that you can multiply by to uh, by your uh, element. Each one only has a unique inverse. Okay, <laughs> so um, the proof is also very straightforward, and we're just using the properties of groups. So again, as we so often do, assume the opposite. Um, that is, for a element of the group G, assume that uh, both minus A1 and minus A2 are inverses of A, okay? So what do we have then? We have that um, A plus minus A equals E. One thing I should say, uh, 
I haven't really explained this, that there are, up here when I'm using an asterisk, uh, we're using kind of a generic um, notation for the operation. We don't know what the operation is. It's true. It's abstract. It's true of any operation that forms a group. So it could be plus, could be multiplication, could be anything else. Um, the standard way of, uh, of writing about groups is to use either a plus sign or the multiplication sign. Um, and usually, if we use a plus, that usually means that it's a commutative group. Um, or you could also, uh, I could say the same thing here using um, multiplication instead, in which case it would be a times a to the minus one equals e, okay? So it just depends on which operation where we've used to define our group. So here I'm just using plus, but it but just understand that that can be any, op that's the group operation is what that means. So uh, we know that, um, oh, a1, remember this is an inverse of a, so a1 plus the inverse uh, the a, the inverse one equals e, but we also know that a plus the inverse two also equals e, right? Because the assumption is that these are both inverses of a. Then, uh, if they both equal e, then they equal each other. So we have a plus minus a1 equals a plus minus a2. Um, now, what we can do is add an additional a1 to both of these. Because remember, we have that a1 is the inverse of a. So, we're going to add another a1 to both sides. equals a plus minus a1 plus minus a2. Now we're going to group these using the associative property. We're going to do these first. These cancel out using the, the inverse property. So we have e plus minus a1 equals e plus minus a2. And then using the identity, the identity uh, plus anything is, is itself. So we have that minus a1 equals minus a2. Just like we did up here, we proved that we're, we started by assuming that there's two of them, and we just proved that there actually aren't two of them, there's only one. We reached a conf uh, contradiction, so QED, okay? That's the second, the second property of group that's good to know. The third one is the cancellation property. And again, what's, it, what's interesting here is that all of this is just instantly, um, it just instantly springs from the four little uh, properties that we started with that define a group. So this is the uh, cancellation property. Says that A, I'll go back to stars here, equals uh, A, implies that B equals C. This is something that we, this is one of those properties that we use in um, uh, algebra all the time. If you have them, if you have a, you know, like if you have, for example, five times three equals five times four, you can cancel those and three equals four. Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> but still. <laughs> so, uh, so um, what's a better example? If we have, say, 5 times x equals 5 times 2, there, how about that? Then x equals 2. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is, again, to prove this, um, again, we can just um, multiply both sides by the inverse here. So we have minus a, a, b. That's what we started with. So we're just multiplying by a equals... Okay, put parentheses around this using associative. 
minus a times a equals e. Those cancel. That's the that's what the identity is, right? This is the identity property: that e times b equals b, e times c equals c. So we have that b equals c, which is what we wanted. Which is what we were trying to prove, right? That uh, if a times b equals a times c, then oh, sorry, then b equals c. Uh, okay. Notice once again, we're never using the commutative property. The commutative property is not necessary for for these things. Um, and so the final, the final property of groups that I want to show you is that linear equations have a unique solution. in the group. Now, that is a this equation has a solution x in the group and um, on the other side y times a equals b has a solution in the group. Uh, So it has solutions. They're elements of the group, G. Now remember, this is the this is the property that we started with, right? We were looking at integers and trying to understand what do we need in order to solve just such an equation. If we have five plus x equals two, what do we need in, in our uh, system in order to solve that equation? So here it is, based on the, the axioms that we have for a group, we can now prove that this is in fact true. A times X equals B has a solution X and Y times A equals B has a solution in Y. So um, to do this, anytime you have a theorem like this, there's two steps in the proof. First we have to prove existence, then uniqueness. When you're doing a proof, you always have to remember that you have to actually do think both things. First, you have to prove that one that one exists at all. Then you have to prove that there's only one. Um, so, uh, so the first thing to notice is I can just tell you that it exists. And here's why. I'm just going to assert that minus a times b is a solution to a x equals b. So note that we have that a times b. So what do we have here? Remember, we're, we're trying to prove, we're trying to find a value for x, okay? I'm asserting that minus a times b is a solution x to this problem. So all I'm doing is showing you that we're, we're just plugging minus a times b into the x here and see what happens. So this equals a times minus a times b equals the inverse property, E times B. The identity property, that equals B. So I just showed you that an answer does exist because this is always in it, is, this is in the group, so there's always a solution, namely the inverse of A times B equals B. Okay, so that's the existence. Now we have to prove the, exist the uniqueness. So again, we've already seen this a couple times. The way to prove uniqueness is to uh, assume that there are two solutions and then see whether they're, the, they're actually the same one. So assume two solutions, uh, y1 
and y2 for y for y times a equals b. So this is very simple because if this is a solution, then y1 times a equals b. If this is a solution, then y2 times a equals b. So we have that y1 times a equals b, y2 times a equals b, right? We've, we are asserting that these are both, that there's two solutions, these two. And if you plug one in, you get this, you plug the other in, you get this. But if that's the case, they both equal b, so y1 times a equals y2. We just learned the cancellation property, which means that if you're multiplying by a on both sides, you can cancel them. That means that y1 equals y2. That's what we wanted to prove. That means that they're unique. So, okay, so those are four important properties of groups. They're not, they're not necessary to define a group, but if you have a group, these instantly come out. They're, so uh, there's a unique identity. That is that the identity is unique. Uh, unique inverses, cancellation law, and uh, linear equations have unique solutions. Okay, good. Okay, that is it for uh, some elementary properties. Um, that's also everything we've been looking at so far has been infinite groups, infinite sets with a group structure. So next I'm going to look at some finite groups, which to me are way more interesting. That's part three, and then we'll look at an example. Okay, here is the link to the first video in this chapter. Here is the link to the previous video. Here is the link to the next video. And click here to subscribe and please join me on Patreon. The link to that is below in the description. Thank you.